The standard and currently accepted model in cosmology is the Lambda CDM model, called this because of the two main components that it consists of. Lambda refers to the cosmological constant form of dark energy, and CDM stands for cold dark matter. In this video, I'm going to discuss the need for cold dark matter in the universe and all of our best cosmological models, and crucially, what it means for dark matter to be cold, and also why it must be cold. Let's begin with the basics of why we even believe there is dark matter in the universe and fundamentally how dark matter behaves. One of the main pieces of evidence for dark matter comes from studying the rotation curves of galaxies. This means analysing the speeds at which stars orbit the galactic centre in different galaxies. What's found are flat rotation curves. Out to far distances from the centre of a galaxy, every star orbits with essentially the same speed, regardless of its distance to the centre. This is not the case for most things in physics and kinematics where orbital velocities tend to increase with distance from the centre, as is the case with planets orbiting stars, or any centre-seeking force like gravity in a simple two-body system. From the mathematics of orbital velocities and density profiles, the only way to get a flat rotation curve is if the mass contained within galaxies is distributed as a sphere, which extends even further out than where the stars themselves orbit. Yet, as we know, the stars we observe in galaxies all tend to lie on the same plane in a sort of disk shape, not a sphere. Another hint comes from stellar spectroscopy. By measuring the amount of light coming from a galaxy, you can estimate to within reasonable accuracy the amount of mass contained within the stars in that galaxy. You can also quantify the total mass of a galaxy by seeing how objects contained within it move and orbit, as we just discussed, or by seeing how light gets gravitationally lensed as it passes by a galaxy or cluster of galaxies. Comparing the mass from stars to the total mass causing gravity, you find that the stars make up a very small fraction of the total galactic mass. The missing mass does not interact with photons of light, otherwise we would be able to detect it in some frequency range, hence it must be dark. Therefore the main source of mass within galaxies and the universe itself is a mysterious and unknown form of mass, which has since been coined dark matter. Spherically distributed dark matter halos around galaxies is able to explain the observed flat rotation curve and missing mass compared with stars. This is a phenomenological deduction of dark matter. However, the formation of galaxies within spheres of dark matter also comes as a natural conclusion from theory considering the early universe. Going all the way back to a fraction of time after the Big Bang, the universe consisted of what's called the quantum foam. This is a state where even the fundamental parameters of nature fluctuated. A portion of this foam began inflating exponentially, eventually breaking off from the rest of the quantum foam, forming our universe. The rest of the quantum foam could have also undergone separate expansion at different times, which would result in different universes forming as well. Each of these would have different values for the fundamental constants, and we would never be able to interact with them. Back to looking at just the part of the foam which expanded to form our universe though. Due to the quantum fluctuations, the density of the universe would not be constant, and it would in fact vary on different scales. These density perturbations in the early universe are what ultimately cause structure formation like galaxies and clusters of galaxies. Regions where the perturbations cause them to be overdense compared to the background universe grow due to self-gravity, accreting more and more mass over time. Mergers between these overdense regions are the main way structure grows. But let's look more carefully at one of these density perturbations in the early universe. As we've measured, around 80% of the matter in the universe is consisted of dark matter, which only interacts gravitationally. So these perturbations typically manifest as regions where dark matter aggregates due to gravitational attraction between dark matter particles. Nature wants to minimise the gravitational potential energy of the dark matter, causing it to form shapes that are close to spheres over time. These then undergo mergers and trap normal matter within them, which ultimately leads to galaxies forming in spherical halos of dark matter, as we observe and as we predicted. Now let's discuss how this is affected by the temperature of the dark matter. Temperature is the measure of average kinetic energy of particles, so a good way to think about this is that a hot dark matter has particles moving faster on average than a cold dark matter. With this in mind, let's think what would happen if the dark matter in the universe were hot. At an initial density perturbation, the hot dark matter is close together. As time goes on, the dark matter on average spreads out, as the high random thermal motion of the particles in the perturbation mean the perturbation begins to smooth out overall. Think of trying to contain a bunch of fast-moving particles. If there are no walls or only a small potential holding them together, they will quickly spread out over time than a colder, more slowly moving collection of particles. This effect is known as free streaming and is the key in deducing the temperature of dark matter in the universe. If instead the dark matter is cold, the perturbation does not smooth out as quickly 
and in fact perturbations typically grow with gravity, accreting more matter in this case. So free streaming is not as prevalent in cold dark matter. Hence the overall effect of free streaming is to erase density perturbations over time. For a small perturbation, free streaming of hot dark matter happens quicker than the perturbation can accrete more matter via gravity, and so the perturbation gets smoothed out. Eventually there will be a lower temperature whereby the perturbation can accrete matter at a faster rate than free streaming erases the structure. This is crucial, as it means we can deduce the temperature of dark matter by looking at the minimum mass and size of structures in the universe. In hot dark matter, only the largest structures which originated from the largest initial density perturbations survive the large free streaming effect. Whereas in cold dark matter, relatively smaller structures can survive as free streaming is weaker. Therefore, let's measure the size of perturbations over densities and the size of structure in the universe using satellites, such as by measuring the CMP anisotropy spectrum or conduct galaxy surveys. This can then be compared to the theory regarding how structure should look at present in universes with different dark matter temperatures. This is shown here, and what you can see is that the theoretical cold dark matter simulation images matches the observed structure distribution much better than the hot dark matter, meaning that the dark matter in our universe must be cold and not affected much at all by free streaming. Hence, in the standard model of cosmology, we use cold dark matter. If you want to learn more about physics or any other science or math based subjects then check out the sponsor of this video, Brilliant. Brilliant is an online learning platform with fun interactive lessons in a large variety of STEM courses. No matter what you're interested in, Brilliant has you covered. They even have courses on the content relating to this video, like the one on astrophysics. Here you can learn even more about dark matter, cosmology and astronomy, with so much content spread across 30 interesting lessons, it's comparable in detail to a university module. I love Brilliant because each lesson gets you to learn by doing with quizzes every step of the way and excellent diagrams which makes learning fun and feel more intuitive. You can try out Brilliant today free for 30 days using my link brilliant.org forward slash OV astronomy and the first 200 of you will also get 20% off an annual plan only through my URL. I'll also put this link in the video description so make sure you make the most of this excellent opportunity to extend your STEM knowledge. Using Brilliant is the best way to learn new skills in science, math and computer science, so I'm so glad I could share them with all of you. Thanks again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video, and I'll see you next time.